It started with the uh, three of us, myself, Ted Santarelli, uh, John Amlaw from Somerville, I was from Boston at the time, and uh, Gerald Cunningham from Haverhill, Mass, all coming together on a rail fan trip in Lewiston, Maine on the, the 19th of April in 1939. And um, we had uh, all passed our favorite little small town trolley system, the Biddeford and Sacco, on the way up, where, which uh, ran open cars uh, much later than most other systems in the summertime. It was quite a pet of ours. And uh, as we were discussing things on the trip, uh, Gerald Cunningham said, fellas, they've um, ordered the buses, meaning the Biddeford and Sacco was going to give up the trolleys. At this point, the three of us more or less simultaneously said, well, we've got to save one of the cars. We didn't have any idea how we were going to do it. Each one of us had had an unsuccessful interest in something like that in the past, and we knew that an individual of our uh, means couldn't do anything like this, but possibly if a few of us got together, we could do something. And uh, we were going to settle down for just the one car for a while. But um, the next year, uh, Manchester Street Railway in New Hampshire was going out, and uh, there were rumors that a group from Connecticut were going to buy one of the cars that we liked, had found a piece of abandoned right-of-way somewhere up country there, and they were going to build a line there. Well, we found that that was, thought that that was going to be rather damaging to our very small group at that time, that we'd better join forces with them and talk them into bringing the car over here. And it wasn't very long before the whole thing was dumped in our laps to carry out this, this operation. They would contribute uh, money toward the purchase of the car and so forth, but uh, it was going to be up to the treasurer and myself to... Uh, carry this thing out. We started making uh, weekly overtures to the street railway company to try to buy number 38 and uh, seemed to be repulsed. Uh, well, it sort of come back next week and we'll make a decision then. And this went on for some time and uh, we were getting very near to the end of the operating time of the street railway. It's going to be set for April of that spring. This would be April 1940. So. Um, I mentioned this to my dad, who was in the, in the First National Bank of Boston at the time, and uh, he said, well, why not uh, go through the bank and let's see what we, if we can't get you a letter of introduction from the officer of the Public Service New Hampshire account. So we tried that approach, and we went right up to the Public Service building in, in, uh, on Elm Street, and uh, Mr. Schiller was occupied at the time, as assistant Roger Moscrop talked to us about it, seemed to be very enthusiastic, and said, why, certainly, uh, we think it's a great idea. Well, we were very short on funds, and we proposed a price of around $75 for the car on the trucks, and perhaps several hundred dollars more if we bought the motors. And he thought this was a good idea. So we started coming up there on weekends and painting the car up and finding any missing parts and getting the car ready to go. And we stood around the car the last night, afraid that somebody would take souvenirs from it. And uh, at that point, Mr. Mosscrop and some of the other public service people walked by and said, um, he said to them, this is the entire car, is the property of the Seashore uh, Electric Railway, we called it, and uh, no more was said. We, we were making our plans to move the car. We approached the Boston, Maine, got a uh, cost of a flat car shipment over to County Bunk. We got a price from a company then called the Chase Transfer Company in Portland to uh, Riggers to load the car, offload it from the flat car and bring it here. And we... Uh, contacted a trucking company and the head of the company, Eau Claire Company in uh, Manchester, and they were very uh, good about it and said that, well, all right, if you can bring the car over to this siding, we'll come down from our place and rig the car on the flat car for you, and we'll store the trucks for you until you can afford to move them another year. So uh, the next problem came, and uh, the trolley line had now stopped, but the power was kept on in the car barns on both sides of Traction Street, and uh, cut off from the rest of the city and the rest of the lines. They were dismantling uh, bit by bit the trolley wire various parts of the city. And uh, they had a very uh, wonderful foreman in charge of the work there who had been in charge of uh, much of the system when it was running, and uh, Mr. McFarlane. And we talked to him about how we were going to get the car across the river to the other side. And uh, with his tongue in his cheek, he said, well, why don't you call um, Mr. Schiller? downtown and see if he'll put the power on. Of course, expecting that Mr. Schiller would uh, say absolutely not. So very innocently, I went to the phone and called him up, and he said, why, certainly, Mr. Santorelli, be glad to do that for you. Just have Mr. McFarlane pull the switch and put it on again, and he can run the car over for you to the other side of the river. And uh, 
He said, I hope nobody's out stealing trolley wire today. They're going to be in for an awful surprise. Well, uh, one other friend of mine from Somerville, uh, Dan Toomey, was with me. And um, we proceeded to get in the car. And Mr. McFarland made, his, made the trip very enjoyable for us by saying that, uh, now remember, this car is not being operated by the New Hampshire Public Service. This is the Seashore Electric Railway. At this point, we both began to shiver and shake a little bit. We didn't enjoy the last trolley ride in Manchester, New Hampshire as much as we should have, nor the last trolley ride over the Merrimack River ever by any trolley car under its own power. But nonetheless, this was the case. This was getting into uh, the end of June or early in July. I've forgotten the date. We got across the river, and we came to the place where the railroad crossed with a 90-degree crossing called a diamond. And uh, then Mr. McFarland said, well, now what are you going to do about it? Well, uh, we looked at each other before we began to shrink into the ground. He said, very well, he said, we're supposed to be taking down trolley wire today, but what the heck, we said, we'll help you out. So they proceeded to throw some uh, uh, re-railing irons normally, they normally use for putting a car back on the track, down on the ground, and from their public service truck. And they started to uh, derail the car and jack the trucks gradually around the corner. And everything was fine with one truck still on the track. You had your ground and we had the trolley on the wire. But when the second truck came off, there was a crowbar that was making the connection between the uh, wheel of the trolley and the rail and set out some pretty terrible flashes. We had had a permit for moving the car supposedly at uh, between the hours of 2 and 4 in the morning. This was hardly that. This was late Friday afternoon. But um, because the public service truck was there, why it looked uh, very much on the up and up. So the police simply directed traffic, and we helped them direct traffic around it. And in a matter of about an hour, the back end, the rear truck of the car plumped down on the railroad track. They put a hook uh, with a pole called a, uh, a bug on the trolley car with about 500 feet of uh, insulated wire, and the other on the uh, trolley, uh, the trolley pole of the car, and the other on the trolley wire. And the car very nicely proceeded down to the siding, much to the boss and the main surprise. They hadn't seen the trolley car run into its own power on their own track ever before. Uh, the deal with the operation was over for the night. The next morning, Eau Claire's people came down. They jacked the car up, and we pushed the flat car under it. They blocked it down. And uh, I had read in the uh, car manufacturer's instruction on shipping cars that uh, you must always lock all the doors from inside the car and then climb out through the motor traps, which I did. And uh, the car arrived several days later in, in Kennebunk Station, and the Chase Transfer people brought it here. It took some months before we had the money and the means to bring the other trucks over from New Hampshire. Um, well, that's how, our, how we started, really, with a fledgling collection. And then one more car was brought over from Manchester. I think that was a bit of a more amusing operation. Uh, we didn't buy the truck for the car, just the car body. And uh, Mr. Amlaw made these arrangements. There seemed somebody in Manchester was very interested in making 30 or $40 in this move. So we told him to go ahead whenever he was ready. Well, we came up one weekend and the car was here, no questions asked. But one day, our uh, neighbors said uh, that he just drove in with an old coupe and a set of wheels under the car. And he brought it all the way over from Manchester by just hauling it as a trailer. And uh, the, uh, sure enough, there was a part of the thing still blocked under the car. Well, we were uh, puzzled how we were going to get a truck for the car. And the trolleys in Portland were being scrapped. It was a very great shame to us that we hadn't been able in the same year to buy a complete car. Well, they would have given us one. We didn't know how we'd move it down here. And we had been assured that a Portland car would be saved, and it wasn't. But um, we did go and ask for a truck from a car that they were going to scrap. So we got our neighbor to come up with his uh, automotive truck. And uh, it took us two weekends because of uh, various delays and thing. But we jacked the car over and rolled it down this embankment brought the truck down here and eventually mounted it under the other car. And uh, that's about where we stopped until the end of uh, World War II, when most of us had to go off overseas. And uh, a few weekend or occasional trips with gas rationing would be managed somehow or other to come up here and cut grass and do a little protective work on the roof.